characters in the series. I have already learned a lot from um, the other presentations. Um, I wanted to start with my caveat, my obvious caveat that I'm not a Germanist or a, a GDR specialist. Um, and as you heard, I work mostly on the mail outlet network in Latin America. Um, but as um, anyone who studies mail art, and I see a few of you on the call, um, knows you don't really, you're not really um, allowed to kind of bound your, or able to bound your research um, in this geographical way. So I've ended up um, working on artists in Canada, the UK, the US, and in Eastern Europe. And um, I became involved in Ruth's work um, by finding it in an archive in the northeast of Brazil and actually filed inside the folder of her husband, Robert Rayfelt. Um, and I was immediately struck when I came across her work by this kind of in intricacy of the small postcard that I found. And since then, I've had this long engagement with Ruth's work. Um, but I've always felt a little out of my comfort zone and especially linguistically. So um, I'll be very grateful for any feedback from this um, group that's so specialized in the, in the GDR. Um, so when I came across this um, Damen dinner party uh, invitation in Ruth's archive, I became very interested in her status as a woman artist in the GDR. Um, and I interviewed her several times, usually by proxy uh, and once in person. Um, and each time she said she's not a feminist, although her um, answers varied um, over time. But I became fascinated by um, this uh, anomaly in the archive, um, which I have begun to see as a sort of missed encounter between uh, US feminism and um, Ruth. So um, with a brief introduction to Ruth, I'm sure many of you already know her work. Um, she was born in Wurzen, Saxony in 1932. And here's just some uh, examples of her work. Um, she lived in the GDR from its founding in 1949 until the fall of the wall, after which she um, stopped making art. As a young woman, she had to drop out of her education when her parents separated, taking a job as an industrial clerk to support herself. And in 1950, she moved to Berlin, where she met her husband, the artist Robert Rehfeld, several years later. Their apartment studio became a meeting point for East Berlin's non-conformist scene. And as many um, have mentioned, um, including Anna Horakova and um, Sarah Blaylock, this status um, of being in the non-conformist scene was ambivalent and complex, as at the same time, many of the actors were also members of the State Association of Artists. Her typewritten poems and collage works bridged concrete poetry with conceptual art and constructivism through deep exploration of media and information theory and linguistic research. She was able to establish herself as a key participant in the International Mail Art Network. And through her mail art activity, she claimed space as an artist and established communications internationally. She initially had to reply, uh, rely on Robert Rayfeld to rep reproduce her artworks in the uh, early 1970s until she herself became an associated member of the State Association of Artists in 1975 and a full member in 1978. And that may meant being allowed to print a number of um, small graphic works in private print shops. Uh, she soon became a sought after and ambitious correspondent in the International Mail Art Network about which she commented that uh, she says, I was a, as ambitious as a spider in a web, trying to spin my threads to every place on earth. Um, and her works indeed reached Poland, Canada, Spain, Italy, Switzerland, um, and I could go on. It's a, a huge long list. Um, and almost every um, archive that I've researched in um, does have works uh, by uh, Ruth in it. Um, for her, mail art was a necessary, necessary outlet. She reflects, and I quote, mail art was a kind of safety valve and to a certain satisfaction. I was never able to travel. 
although she did travel a little. Um, but I was glad I had contacts throughout the world uh, that all the others who were allowed to travel sometimes didn't have. Uh, the Mail Art Network considered itself a semi-autonomous system, free from varying levels of censorship, from the mores of curatorial taste and the market that governed the art world, as well as the political sphere. It was also an area in which a great deal of pornographic images of women circulated and was dominated by male participants. I want to suggest then that the fresh air, as she called it, that it provided for the artist was also somewhat compromised in relation to the objectification of women and gender issues in male art more broadly. As Ruth said herself, uh, and again, I quote, the whole erotic direction of some men didn't keep me busy. <laughs> so um, I'm going to move on to talk about uh, the dinner parties now. In 1979, Ruth Fulfreyfeld was invited by Suzanne Lacey, who is a well-known feminist from LA, uh, to participate in the International Dinner Party, a simultaneous dinner event to celebrate International Women's Day on March 14th of that year. The International Dinner Party was organized by Lacey and others as an homage to the celebrated feminist artist, Judy Chicago, and her monumental installation, which you see here. Um, and this place setting on the right is the place setting for um, Emily Dickinson. Um, the dinner party, uh, sorry, for Judy Chicago and her monumental installation, the dinner party, that was to open the evening of March 15th at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. Chicago's monumental installation consisted of a triangular banquet table, including seats for 39 women from so-called Western history and mythology. Each of the 39 place settings consisted of a large porcelain plate in the shape of a vagina, an embroidered runner and napkin, a chalice, and a set of utensils. Beneath the table, a heritage floor included porcelain tiles of an additional 999 names. The triangular form of the dinner party table symbolized equality, but also, according to Chicago, a wedge into all those assumptions of the established canon. To organize the spin-off International Dinner Party, Suzanne Lacey, Linda Pruess, and others mailed thousands of invites to women from around the world to participate in the simultaneous dinner. The recipients were invited to host dinners on the same evening that would honor a woman in their own region. Because of time differences, the work constituted a 24-hour performance. At their dinner, the participating women were invited to collectively draft a statement and send it via telegram to the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, where the location of their dinner was marked by a, wait, a waiting lacy with a red inverted triangle on a 20 foot wide black and white map of the world. The telegrams were displayed next to it. Lacey also asked all participants to send black and white photos of their dinner for a later date. There's the telegram. Um, and here are some examples of the, um, of the photographs of the dinners. By the end of the extended day, the project boasted around 300 dinners with over 2,000 participants from all parts of the world. While as a mail art project, the International Dinner Party issued the monumental form of the massive dinner party installation of Judy Chicago in favor of building a network of relationships between women across the globe, its ambition was no less monumental in scale. Lacey and her collaborators mass mailed the invitations and professed to want to extend Chicago's dinner party to, quote, living women to create a, quote, network of women acknowledging women that will extend around the world. Doubtless impressive in its scope and ambition to, and I quote again, expand honoring women of Western art history to encompass living women of all cultures. The organizers made a particular drive for the recipients of their mailings to connect them with others in order to expand the network. And they stated they especially wanted new connections to the Middle East, the Far East, Africa, and South America. And um, Ruth was uh, referred by um, the uh, organizer and male artist Judith Hofberg um, in LA who knew Suzanne Lacey. 
Nevertheless, the organizers proceeded with seemingly little regard for engendering an actual exchange. While mail art networks usually operated on a more narrow cast calls for participation in publications, projects, and exhibitions, that if not intimate was based on a modest reciprocity. In contrast, Lacey and her collaborators broadcast their instructions in the hopes of symbolic rather than real exchange. The open-ended gatherings had no specific aim other than to, quote, celebrate ourselves. It was this lack of specificity, I would suggest, that predestined Ruth's ambivalent response to the invitation that I'm going to go into now. On January 11th, 1979, Suzanne Lacey, or another member of her circle, posted an invitation in Burbank, Los Angeles, to Ruth in East Berlin. Once enrolled in the scheme, Wolf Rehfeldt sent an invitation out for her own Darman dinner party. Here's the invite. Her clever, alliterative, and bilingual title perhaps already hinted at the incongruence of Western feminism in the context of the GDR. Apart from this invitation card to the dinner, which Wolf Rehfeldt herself was organized as a joke, there are few other explicitly women-focused events or work to be found in Rehfeldt's archive or oof. What's the meaning then of this late 1970s anomaly? When I initially specifically asked her about her engagement with women's issues and the subject of feminism, Wolf Rehfeldt espoused that her work does not emerge from a feminist perspective. She insisted instead that and I quote, we are all human. But in a later interview I conducted with her via Kathleen, Kathleen Reinhardt, she, she responded, and I'm going to quote this at length because uh, I think it's worth hearing all of the um, sort of ambivalence around what she's saying. Um, and I asked her specifically about the, um, the Darman dinner party, um, and this is what she responded. As a woman, you are often alone, not only in male art, I now heard that they want to make International Women's Day on March 8th, an actual holiday here in Germany. Um, I had to laugh. That was already the case in the GDR, and on this day, the men made coffee once a year. I had the women's dinner party on a different day, on March 14th. This was called for in the invite, and I had set up the table for this in 1979. I stamped cutting boards with supper. Elried Metz. Metzkes, Dr. Tim, Ingrid Goltzsche, Rosie Rudolph, and others were invited. It wasn't like we came as feminists with a sort of agenda. There, there was an episode that is telling, though. The doorbell rang towards the end, and it was not the postman, but my dear husband and the designer Lutz Rudolph. They wanted to see what we did here as women. And then she sort of pauses, um, and she starts to ruminate on the question some more. She says, I think equality is a funny word. Of course, I'm in favor of it, but I'm not a feminist in the true sense of the word. I think that it's quite natural that you're equal, and it's rather unnatural that it hasn't been that way for millennia. Um, so I'll come back to this quote. Wolf Rehfeldt sent a photographic record to Lacey in the form of a collage. The envelope um, that she sent it in uh, to be found in Lacey's um, files um, has a sticker on it, which says file IDP, file international dinner party. I think the cursory bureaucratic tag is telling because of the, the actual lack of interdialogic communication enabled by the project. So instead of replying to the letter, the letter's filed away. On May 9th, 1980, over a year after the international dinner party had taken place and via a volunteer collaborator by the name of Gloria Reyes, Lacey sent a postcard with a map of the locations, very schematic map, um, and a summary of the event and claimed as it demonstrated that they were continuing the chain of worldwide women's communication. The time lag and that it required a cadre of volunteers to mail the postcards suggests that the organizational feat required to communi communicate with all its participants uh, was very challenging. 
And here's the message. So they printed the postcards um, and then they asked um, their collaborators or um, people they were working alongside. Um, it's signed by Suzanne Lacey, whereas the initial invitation, you know, year before was signed by a number of different women. Um, but I think Lacey became, you know, the core organizer. And then they asked um, these collaborators to then um, add their own personalized message and, and mail um, this postcard to the participants. There are a couple of remaining pieces of evidence in the archive of a continuing correspondence, but nothing that suggests a meeting or exchange of ideas. Um, so there's this invitation to the International Quilting Bee that I don't think that um, Paul Freyfeld took part in. Um, admittedly, the mail art network operated much of the time on this sense of connection and solidarity and sending and receiving could be uh, enough. Um, to return to the quote that I read at length, Wolf Rayfeldt's wry contemporary response to my questioning reveals an ambivalent position on feminism that seems to mirror the confusion and the ambivalence created by GDR policy directed towards women in the 70s and particularly in the 80s. Um, so um, I'm sure many of you are already quite familiar with this history, but um, I, I've picked out a few aspects of it that I think are relevant uh, here. So in 1971, Erich Honecker, then the head of state of the GDR, declared the complete equality of women in our state, both in law and in life. 92% of women were members of the paid workforce at the end of the 1980s. And women had not only a right, but a duty to hold a job, you know, which we can dwell on a little bit to think about how problematic that might be. The complexities of policies directed at women and their effects are quite well documented by now. These policies produce contradictions in the later 1980s mummy politics had the ultimate effect of reinforcing women's roles as domestic child bearers. The Damen dinner party was hosted in 1979, around the time that, according to researcher April A. Iceman, the discrepancy between governmental claims and live reality became a point of contention for women in the GDR. However, as, a, as historian Angelica Richter has noted, in the GDR art scene, women artists only in the rarest of cases made work directed against the male tradition of production and seeing and against the state as a manifestation of the political power of men. Richter goes on. Uh, I quote, the fewest women pursued an artistic questioning of sexual differences and gender identity. In almost all cases, they disapproved of the West feminist discourse and the role of feminism was considered too hegemonic and too incorporative. If a woman artist from the GDI was labeled feminist, she was quickly excluded and the consequences would be damaging for her career, both within the official and unofficial art production. As Sarah Blaylock has recently pointed out, most artists also uh, I quote, associated feminism with the ruse of gender equality propagated in the state socialist image. At the same time, according to Myra, uh, Myra Marx Ferry, the state carried out an active campaign against bourgeois feminism that sought to discredit the example of Western feminists as self-centered and anti-male. So it's important to note that this prejudice against feminist discourse and ideas was not only emerging top down from the state, but also from within the nonconformist scene and as a direct experience of the women themselves. From this perspective, and also to consider her husband's intrusion into the Damen dinner party, Ruth's mere participation in the international dinner party could be seen as daring and even controversial. Another obstacle to the reception of feminism in the GDR had to do with collectivity. A key point of interest in Lacey's development of the International Dinner Party was her research into women's communities, but the conditions for collective action in the GDR were not right. Um, as Marx Ferry writes, although the mixed messages of mommy politics laid the ground for feminist critique, social movements also require structural opportunity for individuals to come together, recognize the collective nature of their problems and develop a collective response. There were clear obstacles to doing so in East Germany. Public discussion of gender segregation was prohibited after the feminist movement gained ground in East Germany. 
And, you know, obviously I'm sure you know that there was a feminist movement in, um, in Germany, but more active in the 80s. Um, a series of works produced in the 1980s, KG Beings, expressed a sense of isolation that Ruth uh, Wolf felt experienced. This was not just her sense of isolation as a woman artist in the GDR, acting at the margins of the official and non-official art scenes. In 1981, she had a bad accident that left her immobile for a period of time. But in a painting from 1976, Sorry if it's difficult to see, it's, it's rather dark. Um, six women. She had already explored this sense of apartness. Um, and uh, hopefully you can see that um, there's all of these kind of brightly dressed figures. And then there's um, a figure in blue and um, kind of lower down, um, kind of isolated from uh, the rest uh, of, the, um, of the figures there. Um, as a typewriter artist operating in a mostly domestic setting, she was literally set apart from the professional life of the artist, at least until she was fully accepted in the State Association of Artists in 1978. So while the Diamond Dinner Party did gather women together, conditions and perhaps personalities were not in place for an explicit feminist agenda to take hold. Nor, as I mentioned earlier, did the project itself, as communicated by Lacey, really provoke a feminist response due to its necessarily vague focus on celebration. To delve a bit deeper into the gender politics latently expressed in Ruth's work, I'm going to consider her choice of the typewriter in relation to the gendered labor she performed as an administrator. A typewriter describes both an act and a person, usually a woman. That Ruth named her works on the machine typewritings denotes a kind of absolute identification with the tool she employed. The GDR was founded when Wolf Rehfeldt was 17, so her intellectual and professional formation coincided directly with the founding of a socialist state that insisted on its definition of equality for women, one in which they would supposedly work and be rewarded as equals, but this, that was still inscribed with traditional gender roles, resulting in a double burden for women, as well as a suspicion towards female authority figures, meaning that they rarely reach the upper echelons of their professions, not to mention representation in the political apparatus. The artist did benefit from the GDR's educational policies in that she was able to attend Humboldt University from 1951 to study philosophy, but she discontinued her studies around the time she made Robert Rayfeld and became pregnant with her son, Rene, when she then became a clerk in the exhibitions department at the State Institute of Artists. She had already learned to operate a typewriter at clerical school and completing secondary school, and she drew on these skills to secure a new source of income. Um, so just some um, more examples of the typewritings. Friedrich Kittler, the German media theorist, takes particular note of the gendering of the typewriter and argues that its neutralization of gender helped enable women's so-called emancipation. Kittler writes, machines do away with polar sexual difference and its symbols. An apparatus that can replace man or the symbol of masculine production is also accessible to women. The typewriter brought about a completely new order of things. In Kittler's analysis, then, the typewriter neutralizes gender, allowing women to enter the workforce, and this quality also bears out in Wolf Rehfeldt's work. There are other degrees of removal and anonymity, which seem to be a condition for her practice. The sign detaches from lived experience, the text from the body, and the word from meaning. The labor involved in each of the works also evokes the passage of time, and perhaps of one's time administered administered and controlled, or the time of one's life violated. I think the duty to work can be invoked again here, as the labor intensity of these works should be seen in this light and in her marginal position in the State, state Association of Artists. In these cases also, the rationalizing machine of modernity, the typewriter, is subjected to the drives and desires of the body behind it, perhaps giving the viewer or recipient the slightest clue about the artist that produced it. 
And I think there's also some kind of um, anxiety about uh, work and whether to be working and proving that you're working, um, you know, as a condition of proving that you're a viable citizen within the, the GDR system. As I mentioned, uh, Ray Felt, Wolf Rayfelt's production operates with degrees of removal, authority, and anonymity. The typewriter replaces and regulates the gesture of handwriting and drawing, concealing the identity of its author. The mailbox allows the author to remain, rena, remain anonymous too, and at a distance. The sign conceals lived experience. These degrees of concealment and revelation concern hidden meanings and linguistic construction, self-expression and self-effacement in the life and outer appearances. Greyfelt said that her Cases and Cages series have to do with sitting as if in a cage, conjuring an image of her at her typewriter, treading this line between being known and unknown and between hiding and expressing your inner life and thoughts. Come to that later. Um, so to return to the dinner parties, and this is my conclusion, which I hope that people will also weigh in on. Um, what if we conceive the Diamond Dinner Party as a missed encounter with a feminist consciousness that could only be explained as a joke by its host? The Diamond Dinner Party was convened on the basis of gender, but without an ideological position. The generality of the International Dinner Party enabled its supposed success but at the moment of its reception in the GDR, feminist ideas were cloaked as a joke, while this status nevertheless concealed complex gender politics. Ruth's stamping of the word supper on the cutting boards um, made a deliberate self-referential, almost defiant rejection or an over-identification with the role of domestic host, turning that role into a postulate for art making rather than subservience. But this hint at gender as a subject matter for exploration never developed further in her work. Would a true exchange of ideas and messages have in, engendered a different outcome? Lacey's interest in connecting with women's communities and bringing value to acts of nurturing and hospitality might also have crossed wires with the sense of isolation Ruth uh, Wolf Ray felt felt. One wonders at the nature of the conversation at the Diamond Dinner Party. And I have asked, but of course, um, Volk Rayfeld doesn't remember um, what they talked about. Um, tasked with celebrating themselves, with what resources did the invitees celebrate or discuss the position of women? Perhaps they indulged in a mild mocking of the US bourgeois feminists, or some extended discussion about the male power brokers of the art world, or indeed the political world, or perhaps they just talked about art or what was for dinner. Thank you, that's the end. Thank you so much, Sana, for this thoughtful talk. Um, I'd like to open the floor for comments and questions for, for Sana. Um, let's begin maybe with Anna. Anna Chevalier, please go ahead. I think you may be muted, Anna. Okay, it doesn't seem to doesn't seem to work. Um, I think Margarita, can you hear me? Are you able to ask? Maybe ben, ask. I hear you. Okay, great. Yeah. Go ahead. I I didn't have a question yet. I did it say that I raised my hand? I think we oh, were just okay. laughing. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Oh, sorry about that. Okay. <laughs> then, then, sorry. The, the floor is open again. <laughs> Still open. Who would like to ask a question or make a comment? Uh, Anna. Anna Horakova this time. Hello. Can okay. you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi. Yes. Hi. Sorry. So, hello from the GRI. I think you can tell them on which floor I am. Mm -hmm. Only you cannot because it's blurry, but uh, I hope that you can hear me. The internet connection is sometimes a bit patchy. So 
Uh, I just, I'm just sort of still gathering my thoughts, but I wanted to uh, first of all thank, uh, thank Zana for this uh, fascinating uh, talk that uh, sort of un unearths these amazing networks. Um, and um, I basically had a question about the uh, terminology of feminism um, in uh, the, especially specifically in the East German context, um, and. Uh, I have myself encountered this uh, uh, quite a bit when I interview um, East German um, artists, uh, female identifying East German artists, they will always uh, preface their work as saying that their work is not feminist. Um, so I've um, uh, basically uh, been wondering uh, to, what these, uh, to what extent these statements can be um, considered um, as um, a sort of um, foregrounding a different uh, idea of feminism uh, in um, sort of recently uh, in the context of the so-called second world feminism, Kristen Gotzi uh, has, has discussed this. Uh, she calls it uh, Eastern, Eastern feminism. And uh, in the context specific to the GDR, I was wondering um, if uh, it might be worth engaging with the theory of Krista Wolf. So the, the um, East German public intellectual, we would maybe say feminist public intellectual, who's sort of larger trajectory involved uh, moving from a, a, a sort of a, 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 a crit critic of socialism to, to a feminist uh, theorist. And um, Wolf herself um, actually distanced herself in the 70s. So this is this is the decade that you're, uh, you're discussing. Um, she distanced herself from, uh, from uh, feminism, which she considered a, a Western concept. Um, but then, especially starting in the late 70s and going to the 80s, she developed um, a theory of this um, of this uh, uh, um, sort of a historically grounded notion of feminism that emphasized uh, equally the emancipation of, of women uh, and men um, from patriarchal structures uh, that uh, I know uh, has been read by, uh, eagerly read by uh, uh, feminist uh, female artists from this, um, mm. uh, from, from these circles. Uh, I'm thinking of Gabriela Stutzer, for example, who also uh, um, collaborated with, uh, with Christabel. So uh, just, just sort of um, wondering to what extent this, this, uh, this concept of, of, of Eastern feminism, to quote Gotzi, of, uh, or uh, the sort of uh, concepts uh, in, uh, in East Germany, another concept is Emanza, so that this, this term Emanza, as opposed to feminist, uh, might be useful for your project. Yeah, that's incredibly helpful. Thank you. Um, I think it's, I mean, the the terminology of feminism, I think, is incredibly um, fraught, you know, as soon as you leave the US and the, the case with um, Latin America is similar um, in that many of the women artists didn't identify as feminists. It was associated with, you know, the US and um, it was considered very problematic and, and it was considered also a very specific response to um, the problems of capitalist society. Um, but then, um, you know, there are people who are using that term in the GDR, at least in the 80s. Um, so I think it's kind of interesting to, to know that um, there was some currency come, and um, I think it's uh, Marx Ferry who talks about the fact that, um, you know, because of the shared language with West Germany, there was much more sort of flowing back and forth in, in um, the GDR than in other um, Eastern Bloc countries um, in terms of um, the ideas, you know, that were circulating. And that's one reason that um, there was a sort of bona fide feminist movement. Um, but I will definitely look into these other um, suggestions that you've made, it's very helpful. Um, I think also just to note that um, Lacey and Co were quite careful not to use the word feminist and they just talked about women and very broadly. Um, and it's, um, I'm kind of using the word uh, feminist, I think, because that's how I identify those US artists. Um, so I'm not trying to suggest that Ruth was feminist. Um, but I think it's very interesting that there was this kind of moment of insertion of feminist ideas in the GDR that was sort of uh, repelled at that moment. Um, but it, there was a sort of 
I would say latent or subtle in action of of those ideas um, in the fact that there was the dam and dinner party was organized. So I'm kind of interested, I think, in that um, um, that response. Like I wouldn't claim, but but maybe your comment is still relevant in terms of just thinking, trying to identify better what Ruth's position is. Um, uh, I think that's certainly would be useful. Thank you for your for your thoughts and for your question. Matteo? Yes. Yes, thank you, Zana, for your presentation. It really reminds me, I'm going back to today's idea of using feminism. Yeah. It reminds me of other artists from from the socialist blog that also rejected yeah, this label, which was really, yeah, as you said, very much imported, yeah, or just attached to them, but they mostly I'm thinking about Poland, for example. Yeah, quite many, quite many, you know, artists from Poland, body artists that really um did not um were you were not using this label and also remember of you know the the first critics from western europe um touring to the west to the to the socialist blog to see what feminist artists were doing they were basically rejecting yeah this this and which relates which takes me to the to a question which is maybe more out of curiosity so you mentioned the network the male art i know it's one of your main topics topics of research I was wondering whether uh, Ruth uh, was also in contact with other uh, artists, uh, maybe women artists within the socialist bloc uh, through the male art, for example. Um, she was definitely in contact with other women artists. Um, and I, Vonda, now maybe you can remember the name for me, um, okay. in Poland. Um, okay. Um, uh, I can I can let you know I can't remember mm -hmm. this name. Um, yeah, I do have a list of the correspondents, um, and like I said, she's in like most of the mail art collections. When whenever I visit one, I find um, um, works by Ruth. Um, but it's I, for me, it's really interesting to think about this. What this contact actually is you know and perhaps like I said the sending and the receiving is enough mm -hmm. but um uh yeah a lot of the time it's just the sort of the participation and there are these rare occasions where artists really do have an exchange of ideas um and so I'm kind of interested in like where the um where the friction is in the, in the communication and almost more interested in the miscommunication than yeah. the than the contact and the communication um but yeah I, I do have a list of the artists she was in touch with so if you're interested I can um yeah. I can have a more thorough look at that good yeah thank you I'm also in Los Angeles so as you know so we, we can exchange oh yeah I'll probably thank see you, you tomorrow <laughs> uh -huh. okay uh-huh all right um Marie Ega please hi <laughs> Thank you for the presentations, Anna. It was such uh, such a pleasure pleasure to listen to you. Um, maybe I can add to the uh, question before. Um, the Rehfelds were in touch with Kwikulik in um, Poland. I actually had the chance to visit the archive of Kwikulik, and there were a few correspondences, not too much though. But um, Sofia Kulik is still taking care of the archive, and she also remembered Ut when I was there speaking to her. So that would be one example um, of a correspondence with another female artist. Um, and I maybe I asked my question first, but then I also have something to show you guys. So um, I would like to ask about um, how far do you think you can call these the call for these international parties a male art project? Um, mm -hmm. You used the term, um, but as I understood, the call was meant, um, it was rather a call for action than a call for the submission of um, artworks or, or letters. Um, but then you showed these letters of the documentation of the photographs uh, that were returned. So I'd be interested in hearing more about that. And maybe just quickly before you reply, it is a coincidence, but right next to me, I have this DVD. I am based in Berlin, so I'm speaking to you guys uh, from Germany. And this is a, a documentary. It's called Rebellen, um, Female Rebels. And it's really a coincidence that I have it on my table right now. I was about to return it to the library. 
Um, this is a documentary about Tina Barra, a photographer. She's a professor in Leipzig and Cornelia Schleime and uh, Gabriele Stötzer, who was mentioned before. And it's really interesting because the documentary um, uh, shows them showing their work. So it's, it's basically visiting them in their studios and they are um, showing the works that they realized during the GDR times. And it's all three of them are women, but feminism is hardly ever mentioned, although uh, many of their works deal with the fact that they were women. Um, so this would be probably somewhat of a recommendation to the group. The DVD, it exists, I think, 20 or 30 times in the public libraries here in Berlin, and it's really hard to get your hands on. Um, it's very popular at the moment. Uh, so if you find a way to um, maybe look at it in the US, maybe the Getty even has it, I'm not sure. Um, otherwise, I totally recommend ordering it. It has subtitles as well. Oh, great. <laughs> Very important for me. Um, uh, well, to go back to your question. Um, yeah, I, I'm not... Um, I'm not so invested in kind of policing what is and is and isn't male art. Um, I think um, I kind of hinted at the fact that, um, you know, I think in in the male art network proper, um, you know, there is um, there are these kind of rules for engagement about and they're basically to do with reciprocity. Um, and, you know, if you're going to do a call, then you know send a catalog um but the the calls tended to be smaller you know a few hundred artists whereas this was just massive and i think um um it's an example of where like the the uh, the sort of apogee of male art you know in the late 70s all sorts of different people were cottoning on to the fact that you could really organize big things through this and I think like another example of it's almost like male art gone wrong um, <laughs> is um, the CAIC, um, you know, the um, Argentine organization that really kind of appropriated the idea of male art in order to send um, um, out these, uh, really kind of to establish CAIC as a center for conceptual art in Buenos Aires. And um um, there was this kind of mass mailing that was very administered and counter to, um, you know, the sort of scrappy um, forms that male art had taken before. And so I think it's just symptomatic of the moment, um, you know, that it was, um, Lacey talks about how it was very expensive to place phone calls. So the mailing was preferable in that respect. Um, and yeah, I mean, it was just a way to organize, but I think the male component, you know, made it possible. Um, and, you know, for an artist like Ruth, who's existing as an artist through the male art network, pretty much, you know, that's her sphere of operations. Um, it enables her to take part in something like that. So the male art network's very important um, in terms of that connectivity for. Um, like the international dinner party basically couldn't happen without it, right? Um, so it's like the, it needed the male art network to be in place for it to happen, but it wasn't really about, you know, creating um, a fully thriving network of, of women artists. It would have actually been really interesting if it became um, um, self-sustaining. Imagine all of those, because, the, you know, women were kind of in the minority in the male art network proper, but imagine if all of those actors that had taken part in the International Dinner Party had then continued to exchange, um, that would have been something different, but it was more of a broadcast model. So it didn't, uh, as far as I know anyway, it didn't really happen like that. May I just quickly ask a follow-up question? Um, the, the documentary photographs, do you know if they were sent upon request or um, was there, like, how, how did they come about? Yeah, in the initial invitation, they asked um, for people to send telegrams. Um, I'm not sure how possible it was for everyone to do that. Um, and then also to send a black and white, they specified a black and white photograph of the dinner. 
And so that's what the, that little collage that I showed was. It was um, a postcard of Ruth's um, with the typewriting underneath and then um, the image, uh, the, the photograph of the gathering pasted on top. Thank you. Um, so to me, I must confess, the more interesting part of your talk was less whether Rudolf Rehfeld was a feminist or not then this whole idea of labor and whether labor is somehow gendered. Um, I think Friedrich Kittler is quite wrong about this idea that somehow the typewriter is this, is this media technology that levels any distinctions between gender. That's a very curiously, not unsurprisingly, but very curiously male heroic kind of version of media technology, which is that it mm -hmm. acts to basically erase all difference somehow. I don't think that is the case. I mean, anybody who looks at the statistics of, you know, who operated typewriters in history will realize that it's the overwhelming majority of people who worked with typewriters professionally were women. And so I'm very curious about this question, whether that matters for a discussion of Rudolf Riefeld, um, you know, who operates the typewriter obviously in very idiosyncratic ways and not in ways that very obviously give away her gender. But I'm still very interested in this question of labor and the extent to which, you know, we can sort of, you know, this, this, this discussion could be quite useful. And I'm really grateful for, for you, for the fact that you brought it up. And I wonder if you could maybe comment on it um, a little bit more. Yeah, well, I, I would kind of, I'd be interested if other people in the group also have perspectives on this idea that I put forth about um, the anxiety around labor um, in relation to women in the GDR, because there's sort of duty to perform. Um, and, you know, the definition, you know, this, there's this whole debate about the definition of the worker really being in, in you know, the worker sort of defined as the, as, as a man. Um, but there's this attempt to enable women to enter into that, um, into those roles, but it, it, it's not, um, the roles aren't kind of ameliorated for, um, you know, different perspectives. And so I think um, I'm very interested in sort of exploring further what that anxiety about labor might mean for Ruth, because I think, um, as I mentioned, you know, she kind of, she had her art practice and she had her studies and she had things she was really interested in. And then she had the practical necessity to work as a, um, and as an administrator. Um, and so, um, you know, that sort of question of the duty to perform, I think is interesting. Cause then I wonder if she's sort of performing these laborious uh, compositions as a sort of evidence almost, um, you know, documentation that she is, um, active you know she's not wasting time or uh, I'm kind of interested in that um in terms of I think it's pretty clear that it's a gendered um uh, gendered labor right you already said that um and that Kittler's kind of version um yeah it doesn't it doesn't really help us um it but it does say something about like women entering the workforce and and how it was enabled by this technology um, and, you know, I have this other project about Xerox, and I think it's a similar, there's a similar relationship there. But, um, yeah, I, beyond that, um, I guess I would be interested if other people have perspectives on how how I might develop that, or if it rings true that she she does seem to have this real sense of anxiety and isolation and professional um, disquiet, you know, she can connect with the through the mail art network, but she wasn't really accepted in the state association of artists. You know, she was really a marginal figure. She wasn't, she didn't have a degree. So she wasn't properly, you know, considered to be properly trained to be an artist. And um, she says that there were two people who voted against her being accepted and to, one of whom was a woman. Um, and so, yeah, I, maybe it's a case of kind of going back to, um, to Ruth and asking her a bit more um, about you know that so, since I've only started thinking about that recently I haven't really specifically questioned her about it but I've also found that the sort of line of questioning around gender doesn't get me very far uh, when I'm interviewing her so I don't want to over labor and I think one of the things I experienced whilst writing this talk was 
how difficult it is really to talk about the absence of something um, uh, in an artist's work. You know, as art historians, we're so used to kind of amassing all the evidence that you can see and describe and explore that's in the work. But this is so much about latency um, that it, I found it quite difficult to, um, you know, tease out what, what the questions were. Thank you, Margarita. Uh, hi, Zana. Um, so wonderful to see you. I was um, thinking about this, you know, socialist rhetoric about labor and um, kind of the domestic and uh, the workforce. And uh, since I, I've been reading about the Bolsheviks and constructivists in the 20s, which is kind of when it when it begins and, you know, scholars say, oh, instead of uh, re-examining gender roles, um, sort of the feminine or domestic sphere was closed and opened into the public. So women were let into this like masculine sphere of factory and production and so on. Um, and so, you know, studying male art myself also like I, I, you know, I know most male artists are men. Um, and, you know, I was wondering, is it the kind of, you know, masculine sphere that, you know, few women were sort of let into um, and, you know, if it's possible, especially with the absence of overt feminist rhetoric in Eastern Europe to talk about like feminist, uh, or, or feminine spaces, you know, women's spaces within the male art network. I mean, I'm sure in the nonconformist art in the GDR, these spaces exist, but within the male art network, it gets more complicated because there's so few, uh, actors who, are women. Um, so yeah, I've been thinking about that, as you know, yeah. So. Um. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, I'm thinking about this a lot too, because I'm working with my colleague, um, Elena Stromberg um, on a research project and exhibition um, that we're currently calling Transgressores. And it's about women uh, artists, um, women identifying artists in uh, the male art network or in and out of the male art network, I should say, because, um, yeah, you know, of course, there were some very prominent figures who carved out a space for themselves in the male art network, Ruth among them, you know, Anna Banana, Irene Dogmatic, and um, uh, Pauline Smith, you know, um, who was also somewhat controversial, but um, yeah, without kind of, uh, I think the the difficulty in this discussion is sometimes that you sort of over um, generalizing what it means to be a woman artist, and then um, um, you know, kind of essentializing the feminine and the and the masculine, and that can be really problematic. Um, having said that, um, Elena and I have become interested in thinking about. Um, sort of epistolary tradition and in, intimate communications because male art was really a public sphere you know and um, there was intimacy but there um, in general it sort of functioned as a, um, a network within which to publish um, and of course there were the side conversations and um, intimate exchanges that happened but you know it was all about the exhibitions and the um, and the publications and the projects and participating in these um, collaborative things. So um, we've been thinking a little bit about that kind of this sort of intimacy, the long history of the epistolary, the absence of a public sphere for women, you know, in um, historical um, terms and how letter writing was really, you know, the, uh, the one of the only forms of expression for women. Um, so yeah, without kind of over um, essentializing, I think that is something to be teased out. I think um, I mentioned that the male art network was a very male sphere, but it was also, I think we have to remember that it's also um, very nonconformist and queer in lots of respects. So, um, you know, many of the artists that were constructing these spaces, um, were were gay artists, you know, um, were sort of non-conforming in in terms of gender. There was a lot of play with gender, um, and so yeah. At the same time, there were elements of the network that were very, um, you know, masculine and um, bordering on offensive. <laughs> um, there were others 
um, I think that in general, the male art network was very much about sort of self-expression and, and querying of identity. Um, so um, yeah, uh, that's sort of where I'm at on thinking about those questions. Thank you, Zana. We have time for one more question, Isotta. Yes. Hi, thank you so much, everybody, and Zana, first and foremost. Uh, do you have uh, more information uh, about the artists uh, who participated in the dinner party with Ruth, who they are, they were? Because I, I, I caught some of the names you mentioned, but I, but I, yeah. A little bit. Um, yeah, I would be interested if anyone um, knows more about them. I did, you know, the cursory searching um, and um, they were mostly, um, women artists, um, print makers. Um, she said there were also other people there, but um, I don't, um, she doesn't remember who the, they were. Um, hang on, let me, to get my my text back to, to find it. Um, but yeah, um, I looked into their work a little bit and just found that, um, you know the kind of interesting artist one was a textile artist um can you share the list yeah. later maybe i'll i'll um i'll paste it into the chat for those who are interested um but i think they were you know known artists and i found um a good deal of information um and then um she said that dr tim was um an art historian uh, who then moved to the West. Um, but I could not find any more information about Dr. Tim. So there's um, a, a very interesting um, comment from Anna Orakova um, that I think you can all read, uh, but I'll read it anyway. Jonathan Bolton's Intro to Worlds of Descent might be a good point of reference here. Bolton at least comments on female typists in the context of Samizdat in Eastern Europe, typically women with the invisible labor reproducing via carbon copies, et cetera, the writing of unofficial or illegal male identifying writers and artists publishing in Samizdat. Yeah, I think that's a mm -hmm. good comment. Um, yeah, thank you. And thank you. yeah, well, with, with that, I, I want to thank Sana for, for being here, for for presenting this interesting material to us. Wishing you good luck with the rest of your research. And thank you to everyone for your presence, but also your comments and questions. And I'm going to send you the, um, the uh, URL for the Graduate Center for Literary Research, where we will be posting Zana's talk as we did with all the other talks in the past so that you can access them there as well, if you wish, within a few days. So thank you again, everyone. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye.